a moment to think about, especially with Remembrance Day this week. Um, let, let us uh, just take a moment and think about why we're here and the freedom with which we are here. And the, I think I'm very grateful that we are here and able to have this conversation um, in, uh, in this beautiful facility. Um, my name is Jen Ford. I'm a counselor here in Whistler, and I'm pleased to be the acting mayor this week while Jack is on very well-deserved um, time away from Whistler. And so it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, and thank you for being a participant in something that's very important to our community. It's something that many people take for granted. Um, as we can see, uh, this room is not full. We would love for it to be full. I do believe that there has been a lot of engagement in our uh, pre-budget sessions through our website. Uh, we had a survey. Uh, we've had a number of different ways for community members and community groups to engage in this process. And we encourage everyone here to tell your friends to come next year because this is fun. And it's also uh, the most important part of the work that we do as a community is how we fund our municipality. So, um, so please tell a friend and, um, and there will be more engagement through our website um, as the days go on. And um, certainly encourage people to come to the budget meeting um, in a month or so when we have guidelines. for guidelines. December 19th. December 19th. Very close to Christmas. What a gift. <laughs> okay. So um, <laughs> with that, I'd also like to take a moment and acknowledge that we are grateful to be here on the shared un unceded territory of the Leawak people and of the Skohomish people. And please take that seriously. Um, their uh, land acknowledgements are not just something we say at the beginning of the meeting, but it is a moment for us to take some time and think about our relationships and, and really put that meaning behind what we do. Um, council is here and we are listening to this process. This is one step into, the, um, into how we form the budget. Um, staff do a tremendous amount of work uh, to build um, build the budget and they don't leave any stones unturned. This is um, really, really important work and it is hard work, especially with the uh, current state of the economy. Inflation is on everyone's mind. This is not something we take lightly. We have to plan for the future and we have to address the needs of today, but we don't want all of the burden of the cost of replacement of our critical assets to be a moment in time. This is something we spread out over generations and this is a big part of the work that we do. Uh, community input is one piece of how we make our decisions. We also look at our long-term asset management plan, which is a lot of work. <laughs> and our big move strategy, our master plans, our economic and demographic trends, and of course, new legislation from the provincial government. I'm sure you've all been following very, very closely the last several days and weeks. Um, there are many new pieces of legislation in front of us from the province in both emergency management and in housing. And how those pieces of legislation will affect Whistler and the life that we enjoy here are very, very important. So please tune into that if you're not already. Um, Council also uh, considers all of the various sources of information that, to land on our final budget. We can't do it all in each budget year. Uh, there will be trade-offs, there will be sacrifices, that's how we do this work. Uh, but your feedback is very valuable to us and helps us make these decisions. Um, so please share your information with us. Steve, thanks for being here and sharing your ideas with us as you always do. And, and so many people in this room have brought their ideas not only to this meeting, to the afternoon session where we had lots of people um, come and share their ideas, but um, in every committee and in every community engagement that we offer, um, that is an opportunity for us to hear and to prioritize the work that we do. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to CAO Jenny Cullen, and thank you all. <laughs> we'll set that up. Um, so I've got four slides I'm going to go through and 
then I'm going to pass it to Carly Price, who is the main show tonight. Um, but before I do, I just wanted to um, kind of give some overall framing for the budget. So as a municipality, we spend a lot of time imagining what Whistler's future may look like. We've done this in a various, we do this in various different ways. Um, the Whistler sessions was one way we did this in looking at stories of uh, Whistler's potential futures. Uh, we have a balance model that helps us uh, map out current trends into the future based on visitation and population forecasts. And then we're also working on a long-term housing strategy that's embedded within our housing action plan. So this idea of what does the future hold and how do we need to prepare and evolve for it is something that is kind of in our minds and our day -to -day, in our day-to-day -day work. So when we're in the budget process, we very much treat it as a touchstone point where future thinking is made concrete through commitments to service levels, capital investments, and reserve contributions. Uh, the allocation of taxpayers' funds is an important and serious task. It involves considerable review, analysis, and consultation, and iteration to get it right. Thank you for being here and for taking the budget seriously alongside staff and council. So in terms of external factors, um, I'll just go through quickly. You know, we, we have all of our local pressures and our um, prioritizations, but we also need to be cognizant of external factors. Um, having an awareness of this big picture context is important as we understand um, how our resources should be poised to respond to changes in our work. So on this slide are a couple pictures. The one with the road is meant to um, demonstrate uncertainty. So within our world itself, we have a lot of um, horrible geo geopolitical context at the moment. We have affordability crisis, we have climate change, and in general, just a less predictable landscape. We also have housing and affordable cha affordability challenges that are acutely felt in Whistler, but we know they also expand um, to within our province, within our country, and other areas of the world, and that's important for us to keep in mind. And then, uh, Councillor Ford mentioned this already, but inflation, um, our costs everywhere are inflating. Um, this is specifically hitting uh, the cost of our affordable housing projects and the care and maintenance of our RMW buildings and infrastructure. So it is an important consideration and a, and a stress on our budget. Finally, climate change, with the picture of the fire, you know, Whistler is a high-risk wildfire community. Um, we are doing lots of leading work locally on improving our wildfire defense posture. Um, this involves emergency planning, evacuation planning, crisis management, regional coordination, fuel thinning, fire smart. There are a number of different things underway. But we know we also have a provincial task force that's looking at this provincially, and we don't know what kind of requirements are going to be made of municipalities in addition to what's already there. And so this comes down to being being cognizant of needing um, adequate reserves to respond to unknowns that we may become through, that may be in our future. So given all of this, um, the last picture on the far left is, is around organi organizational readiness. So do we have an organization that can adapt to change quickly and nimbly? Um, so what efforts <coughs> do we need to make to ensure that we have a municipality that's ready for these various possible futures? And that's embedded in the budget that you see before you. Um, we have two we have different ways of being able to divide up our budget. The storyboard that you see out in the library are one way of doing it. Another way of looking at it is through um, council priorities, which are on the left in the circle, and then looking at our core municipal work, which sometimes shows up in the priorities and then sometimes is just our core work that we get done day to day. Um, Carly's going to speak about our reserves balances and how they are critical for ensuring we have the money for the care and maintenance of our built assets. So this is everything from roads to pipes to parks to buildings. And I do want to mention that our day-to-day -day work, our core work, is our teams issuing permits, clearing snow, repairing buildings, lifeguarding pools. Um, that work is done by all of our teams and it's the backbone of what the municipality does and I want to recognize it as it can get lost in some of our conversations. And then finally, just a reminder that within the strategic plan, we have a number of projects and initiatives that support these council priorities. I would say every single one of these on the page are already underway. They're embedded as a project or as an operational priority within our work plan. And one thing that is, is not 
necessarily um, outlined in this, but it's important to note, is the way that we're delivering housing through our two subsidiary corporations, Whistler Development Corp, and through uh, Whistler Housing Authority, that's not necessarily visible in our budget. However, it is a really important part of the work that we are doing right now. It's our top priority, and it involves cross-divisional work through many different divisions or departments in our organization. So if you want to hear more about our housing initiatives specifically, please speak to a member of staff and we'll give you a bigger and better outline of what's there. So with that, I'll pass it to you, Farley. I'm going to pause just before I get started and invite everyone in the back. There's plenty of seats here. I promise you it's more comfortable than standing. And if anyone who's outside the room wants to come in, you're more than welcome. We're only going to be together for about 30, 35 minutes, followed by a Q&A. So if you feel pressed for time, you're welcome to stand outside. We love seeing all these smiling faces nice and close. Great, so as mentioned, we're here to discuss the 2024 budget. As a reminder, the municipal budget includes five separate standalone funds. These are distinct funds and categories. Each has its own funding source and its own areas of responsibility. These are shown on the screen in front of you. We've got our three utilities fund, water, wastewater, and solid waste. We've got the hotel tax in the form of RMI and MRVT. And then, of course, the general fund, which contains most municipal spending and projects and is where general municipal tax lands. Within each of these funds or areas of responsibility, there are planned spending and sources of revenues. The revenues include things like property taxes and user fees, and they also include things like non-tax revenues, which include parking fees, admissions to Meadow Park, and things like that. Another type of expenditure is reserve contributions or savings, and this essentially reflects the value of consumed built infrastructure in any given year. This money flows into the uh, project reserves, into the fund reserves, and onward into projects. So when you view the projects list and the operating budgets list, these are two distinct categories of spending, but are funded from the same sources. Now, in addition to the mechanics of the budget and how it works, we have some important guiding principles. These are three broad aims or pillars of the budget. These are the heart of budget construction. We've got responsible stewardship of shared infrastructure, efficient delivery, and increasing resilience. Ms. Collins spoke a little bit earlier about each of those. And we'll spend the next 30 minutes or so on a journey through the budget following these guideposts. We're gonna talk about where we find ourselves today, so the context for the budget. We're gonna talk about the current plans for spending and then importantly, what does this mean for rate, rate payers? Let's get started. Where do we find ourselves today? First, a temperature check. How is the community feeling about RMW spending? What does the community think is important for the budget to consider? Our first look at this was the early budget engagement survey. We asked respondents to rank council priorities and also asked for relative ranking of investment priorities. How different elements of the budget and municipal work felt relative to one another. Important to note that while we had over 200 respondents to this survey, it is not a statistically significant sample of the population, and so it's an indication of where the community <coughs> lies rather than the final word. Now what you'll see here is that housing was ranked the number one priority amongst the council strategic priorities, followed by climate mitigation and adaptation, community engagement, and finally smart tourism. Interestingly, these were ranked differently depending on how long the respondent had been in the community. So for example, the folks who've been for here for 15 to 25 years or more ranked smart tourism ahead of both climate mitigation and community engagement, and it was the opposite for the newcomers to the community. As well, we had a slight difference in how the, the scope of the investment and which priorities respondents prefer over others, and that's in the box on the right. We also asked uh, respondents to weigh the, the benefits of spending today versus the benefits of saving for tomorrow, and the results are on the screen. So 79% of our respondents suggested a balance between spending things that feel good today and saving for the future was the way forward. So now, what else is true about our current position? It is absolutely necessary with the municipal budget to be fiscally responsible 
and to minimize the amount of money we collect from ratepayers. We also have responsibilities that I outlined a few slides earlier, the three pillars that must, must guide decision making. In the last decade, the scale has been weighted towards minimizing the amount of tax collected. We have better information now and can make better choices, and there's still time to make up for lost ground. Now I say we've been under collecting, which may seem like a bold claim. What do I mean by that? And how do we know? One way to measure how you're doing is industry statistics. How other organizations in similar positions, other municipalities, approach taxation. We all share similar challenges, so who stands out? Here we turn to the Local Government Data Entry Database, the LGDE. This is a standardized collection of information, again collected annually from all municipalities. It is unbiased and complete information and can yield a lot of very interesting insights. First, we can look at the cumulative increase in taxes over a 10 year period within BC. On the chart in front of you, you see various uh, communities, primarily but not exclusively in the lower mainland on the bottom axis, and then the 10 year average annual increase in taxes collected and user fees on a representative house. What you'll see, is that the average is around 4% and Whistler is the far left-hand scale of that chart. The average, yet you'll see in the striking lines and then you'll also see Squamish and Pemberton in the diagonal lines. So that's been the 10-year look back on Whistler's annual increase in tax collection. Now the net results of relatively small increases in tax collection over a long period is of course a relatively low mill rate. Here we turn to data provided by the Altus Group, which surveys tax mill rates across the country. So these are various big cities in Canada, and you see here that the average mill rate for these big cities is 9.06 for 2023. Now BC has the lowest mill rates in Canada. As observed here, you've got Vancouver at 2.78, and Whistler lower again at 2.27. Remember that mill rate is the dollars per thousand of assessed property value collected in taxes each year. So rates in Vancouver are 70% below the average for other big cities in Canada, and Whistler is below this level again. Whistler is, in fact, charging the lowest mill rate among all 165 municipalities in BC in 2023. Again, you see the mill rate on the left, and then all 165 municipalities along the bottom. Now, mill rate is, of course, a function of the funding needs of the municipality and also a function of the value of the home. Is this low mill rate a simple function of rapid property price appreciation in the community? Of course, they're linked, but they're not truly independent. The community still has a choice to make. On this slide, we pair the annual increase in tax requisition with the annual increase in property value. So tax changes over that same 10 year period appear on the bottom axis, and the change in the, the annual assessed value of a representative home appears on the y axis. Now, Whistler is not the only community, Whistler's in the red dot, not the only community that has experienced significant price appreciation. If we look at the collection of communities that have experienced 11% or more annual property price appreciation for the last 10 years, there's more than a few. So that's all the blue dots above the black line. In these other cases, these communities have chosen to increase their taxes by more. They have chosen to fund their communities in different ways. Two of these dots, I've included Squamish and Pemberton here again, and interestingly, Four of these other dots, which are the purple ones, are other tourist-facing communities, including Euclid, Tofino, Cumberland, and Revelstoke. What can we conclude from this slide? First is that tourism and property values are seemingly linked. Property values and the services demanded by owners of those homes are also linked. This is an important element of the context conversation. So how can all this be true? A decade of low tax increases, record low mill rates, 
and Whistler homeowners still feel under pressure on their taxes. It's important here to remember that there are a variety of items included on the tax bill, and not all of these are municipal in nature. So now we turn to speaking in dollars. We've got a representative home here that matches up with the values in the previous charts. We see the charges due on this sample property in any given tax year. So value and taxes due. Of these amounts, a small portion is the municipal tax, and some are the utility parcel taxes and fees. The remainder are represented from other taxing entities. So two things can be true at once. Taxes due can feel high, and the municipality might still be under collecting. How do the dollar values stack up against peer communities? This table shows uh, representative home values. Again, these are determined by LGDE shows the total taxes, fees, and charges due on that representative home, and then the municipal share. Now, Whistler property owners pay rates that in dollar terms are in line with other communities where property values are significantly lower. So take, for example, New Westminster and Oak Bay. Similar amounts of total taxes due, much lower property values. Also important to note, is the amount of these total charges that flow to the municipality. 62% in the case of Whistler, and 72% for these other communities. So a smaller portion then in Whistler than in other places. And one final thing to consider when we think about the level of taxes and fees. And this is the last chart I promise, so those of you <laughs> whose eyes are glazing over, the end is nigh. The question we pose then is what does all this money buy? Service levels, of course, in each of these communities is different. One way we can look at service levels is to look at built infrastructure. These are the amenities that we enjoy as a community. What does that look like? So on this chart, again, we've got all 165 municipalities in BC. And then on the x-axis, we've got the per capita tangible capital assets. So all the capital assets represented in that community divided by the population of that community. The average for BC on a per capita basis is 11,100. Whistler's value is $32,705. Now, we know that Whistler is a resort community and that we do effectively need to adjust for average daily population, which includes tourism tents. When we do that, we get an average per capita, including tourists, total tangible capital assets of 14,133, still significantly above the average. So Whistler residents enjoy an extraordinary amount of shared community amenities, in part because we're a resort community. This is true even after adjusting for the presence of those tourists in our community. Resort communities also enjoy unique revenue streams provided by the province, things like hotel tax. These revenue streams cannot yet be applied to the repair and replacement of all those extra built amenities, and that's a need we'll need to address in the future. For now, the context in which we operate is one where taxes feel high in, on a dollar value basis, in part because of property values, but that are low relative to other high property value communities and that don't yet reflect the outsized volume and value of the physical things we enjoy in this community. And it's not just physical things, but also services that align with our priorities as a community and those tourist demands. Here's a small list of things that have been added to the municipal work plan in recent years. And so it seems we've unearthed the core challenge of budgeting. Budgeting at its heart is weighing the balance between those in the community who believe that taxes are far too high and those in the community who want more and more things from the municipality. Balancing this challenge is at the heart of the budget process. So we've laid out the context and moved now to how these priorities take shape in the budget itself. What we've got in store in the coming years, and again, how we balance those responsibilities in a world where there's taxes too high and services too smart dichotomy. <coughs> First up is the utilities work. So as I mentioned in the opening comments, we've got three utilities funds that operate largely independently of each other. 
These deliver things like water, sanitary sewer services, and solid waste service. We need to fund the operation of these assets and also the maintenance of the assets that support those deliveries. Significant renewal is underway in many of these categories and the costs are up. And so we have proposed some changes to rates for 2024 that include 5% in the case of solid waste, 4% in the case of water, and 7% in the case of sewer. One of the most exciting projects underway that some of this funding will help progress is the South Whistler Water Supply Upgrade. So this is a new booster pump that's being installed in the Function Junction area south of Whistler. And the most exciting piece of that, this is that it will create a new connection between the south area of the community and the north area of the community to be able to distribute water, uh, I believe, in both directions? One direction? Both directions. Both directions. Great. <coughs> uh, it will also introduce a new water treatment that will increase the pH of the water to meet BCH standards. So this work is underway today and represents a significant spend partially grant funded in the 2024 budget. Moving on to hotel tax and hotel tax funds, these are being put to work on some important parks revitalization. So once again, tourism revenues must be spent on tourist-facing amenities. They also must be spent in a manner and on things that are agreed to in advance in collaboration with the province. Here we've got uh, Rainbow Park on the right, which as you all know was underway uh, beginning this past summer and ought to conclude early next summer. And then on the left, the schematic drawing of uh, proposed changes to the splash zone in Meadow Park, which is also scheduled to progress in 2024. I won't spend much time on this since uh, Ms. Helen already addressed this, but outside of the utilities funds and moving to the general fund, this is really where we start to see council priorities take shape. So these priorities are built into the work plans of people throughout the organization. We are sometimes asked why we don't have a Department of Employee Housing or a Department of Climate Action, we do a little bit, or a Department of Community Engagement. And part of the reason for that is that this work is embedded in all the work that we do. So I've included here a few uh, bullets that you may have already seen that describe some of the specific actions that we're taking as an organization to advance those council priorities. And many of these just go the budget as well, despite the fact that they're not contained in separate uh, categories. And then of course there's the core municipal work, which is the, the process of keeping the lights on and the wheels turning. And so we have a long list of things that happen every day. This is also where you'll see the shape of the organization change over time and where the, where the resiliency of the organization begins to be built in. These are all things that we're focusing on in 2024 and beyond, and I wanted to take a moment to highlight one in particular. And that, of course, is the Wonder Lab. Now, some of you may see, have seen this when you uh, were spending some time with our pizza and our staff earlier in the day. This is a facility next door, and it was new to the community in 2023. The Wonder Lab is essentially a place where young people can go to uh, access digital creation resources. So these are things like a sound booth to record music or podcasts. These are digital tools that we can use to edit things and create um, music and edit photographs. So this is to young people today what I would think of as and like old people. And old people. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't step foot in there. I didn't know where to begin. Uh, but this is sort of the Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica of today. And it's important as an organization that we meet the needs of people in all demographics, including some more experienced folks and the <laughs> <laughs> And so it's, it's, it's a tangible outcome of the reshaping that happens in the organization every year. Another change that's forthcoming in the library in the proposed budget is two additional operating hours. So again, this is in response to community needs and the fact that extending these hours to 6 p.m. on a Sunday solves for other issues, including congestion in the community when the ski hoe closes. So one facility, two great changes, things that cost money is the takeaway. And then finally, we've got reserve contributions. Ms. Cullen alluded to this one as well. And what this means is that reserve contributions are and must continue to be a significant part of the money that we collect. So in every year, we're aiming to collect from ratepayers 
and the map that represents the value of the degradation in the built infrastructure in that fiscal year. So we're assigning a value to the use of the things available to each community member. This is critical work because even where it doesn't match up with the actual spending on renewal and replacement in those years, it is vital that that value be assigned to the right people. If we delay these expenditures, if we delay these collections, we kick the can down the road and land even greater costs on people in future years. It's also true that delaying this work and delaying the collection of these monies adds to costs in the long run if we end up addressing things through emergency repairs rather than regular maintenance. So for 2024, you'll see higher reserve contributions that we think start to move us into a better alignment with the assets that are already in evidence in the community. So to summarize, uh, we know that the RMW has a long history of constraining tax increases. This is true relative to other BC communities and also true relative to other taxing authorities who are present in our community. This approach hasn't always been uh, helpful to our installed asset base. We need to start being more attentive to the assets that we have. We need to consider carefully how and when we add new assets in the future. And of course, we need to be collecting for those reserves and that asset degradation at the right pace. We also know that RMW operation needs to meet the challenges of today. This typically looks like adding new things to the work plan. Sometimes it looks like dropping things away. But over time, the, the organization does need to transform, and that will be visible in the budget. So the final stop on our journey then is translating all of this into costs for individual households. So what does that mean for property owners? Proposed for 2024 is an increase in the general municipal tax requisition of 8.18%. And then of course the changes in utility user fees and parcel taxes that I mentioned earlier. I'll remind you again that on the tax bill, only a portion of the total amount flows back to the municipalities. So when we talk about those rate changes, we're talking about this slice of the donut. The other slices, uh, responsibility for those lies largely with the province and these other taxing authorities, and we won't know what those increases are until later in the new year. So in dollar terms, we've got increases on the utilities side that total $70.25. This is comparing 2024 to 2023 for a typical house. So again, this is someone who is connected, who has access and is connected to both the water and the wastewater system, and also uses the community collection points for their solid waste. Now when it comes to property taxes, it's also important to remember that, that how each individual property experiences the 8.18% <coughs> increase depends on the, the change in the assessed value of that property. So for a property that increases in value in line with the community average, which for this year is 0.2%, that property will see the 8.18% increase in their municipal tax requisition. For properties that increase as, at a greater rate than the community average, taxes will increase more. And for a property that increases less than the community rate, taxes will increase less. So let's look at three different, four different examples of uh, sample properties in the community. So we've got WHA, condo, single family home, and business, and we've assigned just representative values for each. So in the cases where those properties have increased again in line with the community average, you're going to see the 8.18% increase across the board. And then of course in dollar values in that bottom row. WHA properties are a little different in that their appreciation is not tied to the real estate market, but instead, instead to different types of inflation indicators. So in this case, the WHA property appreciates more quickly than the community average single family home, and so the tax amount goes up more quickly as well. For a million dollar condo in the village, for example, the expected increase year over year in the municipal property tax requisition is $103.48. So again, just wrapping it all up, uh, for us to achieve our goals, to continue to keep this community the vital and vibrant place that we all know and love, we do need to finance it appropriately. That means the reserve contributions need to continue to move higher. It means that we need to consistently and efficiently deliver a high quality of municipal services. We need to take concrete action towards our climate goals. 
and then we need to take into consideration each year what is demanded of us by the changing environment and to implement those changes in our work plans. We are midway through the budget process today. This is our budget information meeting on November 9th. This is your opportunity to provide feedback to your, through your council, through your mayor, and also through our, our available online tools so that we can hear you and understand where your priorities lie. Next up will be budget guidelines, which will be delivered in an open council meeting on December 19th, and then finally the five-year financial plan on January 9th. So we want to hear from you, and we've provided myriad different ways that you can reach us. Uh, if you are of a tech savvy generation, you can take the QR code and find your way to any one of these uh, touch points. Uh, and that is all I have. I'm going to hand it back to, and thank you for holding your questions. I'm going to hand it back to Acting Mayor Ford. She actually has oh, she had to go. Okay, so instead we get <laughs> Ms. Cullen back. We're just into questions. Oh, okay, great. So with that in mind, I am happy and so to open it up to questions, and both of us will be available as well as some staff in the audience to answer anything we don't know. Yes, sir, in the back. I'm curious on the revenue side, is there uh, any action being taken to try to apply for a portion of the property transfer tax? Does one of the council want to go? You go. Uh, oh, so, oh, so we're, sorry, I'm Ralph. <laughs> all of you. <laughs> we are liable for the property transfer tax and we've gone to the province we go to the province every year at UBCM and we ask for a couple of things. We One is we ask for the threshold uh, for the um, homeowner credit that we get to be increased to $2 million. They say, they laugh out of the room every time they're saying, no, it's staying at a million for as long as we're alive. So that's one. And then the uh, property transfer tax, even we are liable for when uh, we transfer it uh, from the municipality to the WDC. So again, another non-flyer. And, but I think he's asking about whether we get a share. Of, are you asking whether we get a yeah, share? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh yeah. no, we get none of it. I don't yeah, speak just for Whistler. I yeah. think all communities and maybe Jen and UBCN could help with this. But uh, we must send a billion dollars to them, if not more. If not more. And uh, Gary Watson, uh, God love him, God rest his soul, came to us with a proposal that we brought to the province. Again, a non-starter. Kathy and Jack and I met with. Uh, the finance minister at the time to claw back a portion. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be a new tax, but uh, or no to add a one percent portion that the municipalities could have. And again, that was a non-starter. We continue to ask, but it, the question has been raised. The the, the tax or the strategy with that is that it needs to be a full provincial ask because they need to change the whole. The, what we were told is they would need to do a full legislation change, and they wouldn't be doing that just for Whistler. So we need to encourage our other municipalities to be asking the same questions. They're not going to do stuff for us that they would do for anyone else. <laughs> well, resort but, municipality, sure. special designation. Yeah. And, uh, it's just an opportunity. It's a door we shouldn't close. Hundred percent, and we'll continue to ask. Gary's name. I asked the question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great idea. Like, it, it all makes sense. <laughs> Uh, I've um, I've looked forward for over four years now to see the final work of the strategic planning committee and the balanced model is mentioned back a few slides in somebody's presentation I can't remember mm -hmm. um, but to my knowledge that actions and strategies that were promised over a year ago still not at least I don't know what they are, and so I begin to wonder uh, how you guys are coordinating all our priorities when we really haven't defined our priorities yet. So I can speak to how we're using the balance model right now, and so what we did in the past eight to 12 months was um, streamline the model that was built. It was quite extensive and comprehensive, but we needed to pare it down so we could use it as a more nimble tool. So we spent time doing that. It is now being used alongside the Strategic Planning Committee 
to, which is now shifting to housing and strategies, to be able to inform and build out a long-term housing and development strategy for the community. So it's in use and in play, um, but it has not been brought back to the community for engagement yet. We do still plan to do that. Well, why, why are you waiting? What are you waiting for? We needed to update it. We needed to pressure test it because we were not uh, fully confident with some of the outputs. But you're using it. We, well, we've updated it, and mm -hmm. now we're using it. So why don't you present it to the community so that we can see what it is and maybe have an input on we the will direction? Be. Yeah. When will you be? In 2024. <laughs> when in 2024? I'll have to get back to you. Well, I just think that there's such a core principle that we've talked about for four years to enable the, us to adjust our priorities and apply them to all these projects and everything. And while I'm not complaining about the, the work and, and, and what I've seen tonight, I just, I just can't understand. If I was on council, I'd be getting a little impatient to actually get a presentation with the finished thing so we can go to the community and everybody can talk about it. And we know what it is instead of you guys using it yeah. in so we, we would like secrecy. Like I don't, you basically, I don't think that, I don't think that's acceptable. By now, I think it should be made public and discussed publicly um, so that the community knows all the same thing you do. We would like the Housing and Strategy Committee to build um, literacy with it so that they can help us have that conversation with the community <coughs> and roll it out. Because it is a complex tool that you can't just put out there without a lot of support and explanation around it. But again, like you're, now there's another committee base, basing its decisions on, on, a, on a balanced model plan that the community has no knowledge of. And so how, how long, I mean, you'll continuously be, there'll never be a certain, the, the bus doesn't stop so that, so that the plan can go in to take over the driver's seat. It's moving. At some point, the community has to know, or should know, what this committee's been working on for over four years. Uh, I, th I think, John, if everyone can hear me, uh, I think that we do see portions of that. It's not like uh, in January 2024, there's going to be a big reveal, and here's our strategy moving forward. That may come in part, but we have received like the housing action plan. We've received the general manager of community uh, engagement, her action plan for the next uh, 12 to 24 months. So we see these things not as one big reveal, but we see them in parcels as they come out, as they're ready, so that the community will be informed and that council's informed and that council's satisfied with the, with the work that's being done thus far, if that makes sense. Yeah. First uh, few slides, just some clarification. We are known as a wealthy town, and our taxes have been lower than the rest of the province. Terrible. The mill rate has, yes. Why did we do that? Great question. Why weren't we at 8%, 10% 15 years ago? subject and I might be completely off base here, but if I was to compare the infrastructure in Whistler to the infrastructure in Westminster, boy, they got some more stuff there. Mm -hmm. And boy, we haven't got very much old stuff. 
but we'll get to have more. Mm -hmm. So I think that may partially explain that difference. But when all your stuff's new, you don't need a new roof right away. But when you start needing new roofs, they come along real fast. Yeah, yeah, and that's part of the reason why the reserves balance is so important and why collecting an amount in each year that reflects that degradation, regardless of whether you're in year one or year 50, is so vitally important. That. Just the, the comparison of mill rates is, is interesting and valuable because it's relative to a thousand dollars of assessed value. Yeah. I just feel like comparing us to Winnipeg is a, is a bit difficult. So in future years, it would be helpful to see the like, actual tax amount on, a, on an average property versus versus mill rate. And you did have some of those yeah. in for BC communities, but yeah. it's help, helpful in a national so context that, too. The chart that was had the Pan Canada look comes from Altus Group that produces a report every year looking at, at property taxes, and that just happens to be the set of data that they share. Mm -hmm. If you want the more granular data, I think you have to subscribe to their data service, but that's that's the one that they share publicly, but yeah, it would be an interesting exercise. And I would expect to see, as we do here, that you'd see those big cities like the Torontos, the Winnipegs, and then you'd see sort of a normal distribution around the edges relative to that piece. Like if you look at Vancouver within BC, it's kind of middle-ish. Mm -hmm. And so I would expect it to be true in Manitoba, in Quebec, that you have some communities that are really under, have a very low mill rate relative to the big city average, and then communities that have a very high mill rate relative to that big city average. But I'm not sure you'd see any province where the big city was at either end of the tail. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Just maybe a comment and then a question. Um, Looks like lots of this is nuts and bolts, and it's really good to see the information. I was just wondering if there's a, a wish list of nice to haves or major capital projects um, yeah. that, are, that, that aren't part of this. So things that aren't in the plan? Well, I, I didn't see a big expenditure, you know, any sort of ambitious or a flagship. Yeah, so most of Right, so most of the project plan for this year is renewal and replacement spending because we've been a little bit behind on that work. So things like the public safety building needs a full retrofit, so that's a big expenditure next year. There are a lot of examples on the water and wastewater side of these big renewal projects that are expensive, if maybe unimpressive. Well, nuts and bolts, I call it. Yeah, exactly. So this is a very nuts and bolts budget. There was a, a project brought to council last Tuesday around a um, public safety and civic administration building strategy. We want to look at all of our built assets and potential other real estate to understand what is the bigger picture and what do we need to be planning for in terms of large expenditures and updates and replacements over time. So we are starting the process of trying to understand that full picture so we can start to prioritize and think about perhaps redevelopment in some places. representative that was, but I couldn't see, this was quite quickly, sorry, um, that uh, it seems like the people, uh, I just don't want to get it the, the, the opposite way around, that people who have been here longer seem to be worried about different priorities than people who have been here shorter period, and I think it goes a little bit to the gentleman's question on strategic priorities, so how do you base your plan on one or the other? So first of all, this is not representative. Right. There's only 200 respondents. We really need to hold it lightly that way. Um, but is your question around like how it did? No, I, I was I was trying to see the number again, okay. and, and it was interesting that there's if it is a significant difference that one to 15 years there is higher priority for housing and climate action, and longer is lower priority for climate action. Yeah, correct. And yeah. community engagement. slides look at uh, mill rates, percentages of change, percentages, uh, but uh, one slide I'd like to see is where we sit for total assessed value, total tax collected comparable to other towns of 15,000 people. 
we aren't a typical town of 15,000, so even 100,000. I suspect in that case, we need to shoot through the top of that chart. Would that not be correct? Can you ask that again, John? Our total assessed value yes. of property yes. and our total tax collected yes. um, of the town's comparable yes. size, we would stand out yes. and very different than the very generous low mill rate that, it, that appears in some of your charts. So you're thinking of total tax per capita? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we are huge on that factor, yeah. right? So our budget is very large for a very small town. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it'd, be, it'd, that'd be an interesting yeah, slide agree. to show. I think this mm -hmm. shows us looking like rock stars because we've got such a low mill rate and our percentage of change is quite low, but yeah. our revenue is massive from yeah. a tax perspective. Yeah. Uh, and as always with these presentations and these talks, there's, and I say this to council constantly in the target area, but there's, there's a thousand different ways to slice the pie. And so it's always a question of what, where's the most interesting information? What do you think uh, really paints the picture in a complete way? And that's certainly what we'll consider for next year. Sorry, John, that was in the late 90s. So uh, one side of uh, the boulevard was zoned uh, nightly rentals and the other wasn't. So that was, you'd have to ask Hugh O'Reilly that question. I don't know if anyone in this room is on the council of the day. So that came about in our B and B's, which were getting larger. We established a bylaw for B and B's. They had to be in general 100, 300 meters from each other in residential areas. Then they grew to be pensions, which we had a bylaw for at that time. And in 92, when we started developing Nicholas Snork, we said, this is our opportunity to put TAs only in residential areas. And we did. And yes, you're right about one side of the street or the other. That's a sidebar of conversation. But uh, that's where Nicholas North. So Airbnb is legit in Nicholas North. Oh, and that's in Nicholas North Hills property that crossed the highway. That was phase three, and I'm not sure uh, what the zoning is there, but if it's similar to the other side of the road, it's TA zone. It would have been applicable at the time of zoning when the entire property was zoned. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah, thanks for we got a lot when the old timers are here. Thanks for that. Because I didn't know that either. Yeah. 
Can I say something? This ties back to a question earlier about the mill rate being low. And I, I'm a bit of a collector of history, so I always appreciate these too. But I would think that the context of our community has changed. And in those periods, we were trying to bring people here, even up to the Olympics. Everything was like, hey, we want people to come here. We want people to buy our real estate developments, our huge subdivisions that we were building. And so a great, a low mill rate is awesome. Hey, our taxes are low, come here, buy here. And all these people came, and then that inflection point changed, where all of a sudden we were like, oh, I think we're good. Uh, and now, now, now we have to deal with all those things that came from building a world-class resort and making it look great to people to come. Now they're up here. So that, that community context has changed over time. And that inflection point, as you look back, our vision is great. The 2020 vision, we see, oh, we probably should have done something back then. But um, certainly that, I can see that. Can I ask a, a process question? So you have a, a long list of ways that people might provide feedback on this plan. Um, I'm intrigued to understand what sort of feedback you actually want. The next stage in this process, 19th of December. Um, can you encourage me to provide feedback by telling me some way in which that feedback might be possible. something something that would be really useful so we hear a lot from the community that the tax increase is too high and that's as i mentioned been going on for years both uh, and then we hear from people who want things to be added whether it's climate mitigation or whether it's a new uh, ice surface whatever the case may be so we never hear from the lower taxes people what would you like us to let go of because the, the structure of the community feedback we receive is like lower taxes and more stuff <laughs> so let's pair the lower taxes call with like tangible, implementable things that we can stop doing. Because if we don't stop doing things and we want to add things, it just, the challenge again becomes much greater. So that would be one tangible <coughs> thing that can be useful. Okay. Or if we are supportive of actually having suitable reserves, we can also send that feedback. <laughs> Correct. Send Please yes. keep the taxes high and keep this yes. sustainable. Yes, absolutely. Is there a, a, a way of doing a trade-off survey with people? There are. There are lots of online tools that have like a balance, yeah. so you can slide. Do, there's slide. They're very expensive. <laughs> it's like six thousand dollars or something ridiculous. Well, I think if you are trying to get, that's the kind of feedback that would be more yeah. valuable because uh, to the question of. What are the priorities for people? And if that 200 people is not significant, it's not a, a number that you can count on. You, you will get me saying, I think you should be charging for water. Sure. Uh, and you get someone else saying, okay, you can lower the, the tax, um, keep the tax lower, and forget about doing X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. But you get individual views that yeah. you're not going to be able to do anything with that unless yeah. you, and, and the you've already calculated. So I. Yeah, yeah, I think if you want the feedback, you will be more valuable if you find a tool yeah. that... Um, we just had one last year. It was an yeah. online tool mm -hmm. that had a, it's a zero sum, sum game, right? Like more of this and just less of this. And so people could play around with it. It could tell you what the tax rate would change yeah. to. Um, I'm not sure why we didn't have it up this year, but I mean, it was a trial. It was a trial. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I mean, there are surveys, this is trade off. It's asking exactly the question that yeah. you were saying. Tell and we, me, yeah. what do you give up for that? Yeah. And it's not. And we tried to approximate that with the rank ordering. So this or that. It was like a this or that question. Put these these eight things in order of preference. Yeah. So we started to, to speak to that. We we love people to, to reach out to us because again, 200 respondents to the survey is a great increase from last year, from years past, but it's not a representative sample. So we need this, but we also need people to use the tools that we provide to yeah. them yeah. and get people to show up and speak up. Yeah. So if everyone in the room could share one of these links yes. with a budget buddy, that would be awesome. <laughs> yes. I've always thought a real missed opportunity for revenue would be collection of water consumption and metering out. <laughs> and if you want to charge wasteful water users a lot of money keep my taxes at the rate of inflation, I'd be a pleased senior living on a fixed income. So we the environment. So James, do you mind? Sure. So we do have some good news here for 2024. 
So we have been uh, working on uh, commercial water meter rates. Um, it's a pretty slow process. Uh, going back into the businesses, especially here in the village, pretty challenging to put one meter in that actually captures what we're looking for, but we are working our way through that. We have another budget for 2024, and we expect by the end of next year, we will actually have all the meters in place through all of our commercial system. We looked at the priorities and how water is used in the community, and we felt it was important to go uh, through the commercial water meter uh, process first. Um, we're installing new meters where we can read them remotely, uh, very low burden for actually getting the data, getting the information. The next step will be mock billing, so people will see what their bill would look like if we, once we move to the meter rates, and then we're gonna move to the re meter rates. So we're still <clears throat> a couple steps away. Um, the next piece of that process is to look to the residential um, metering as well. But almost all of our homes, I think everything's built since 1993, has a water meter in it. We need to do some retrofitting so we can easily read them. There's a, a variety of different meters out there, and currently we actually have to go and you know, somebody has to stand on everybody's doorstep to read that meter. Uh, there's better technology out there now, so there's a couple steps to do to get to that stage, but it is underway. And we have a significant budget again to advance that for next year. So we're getting there. It's slow. Yeah, it's all the remote water meter readers since the 90s on homes I built that nobody's ever read. We have so, built them a few times for specific data collection points, but we haven't done it on I a consistent basis. Collecting so. revenue. Yes, not yet. It's a, yes. Water's a huge commodity, and we give it away. Yeah. For cheaper than we should, in my opinion. I mean, right now we're collecting as much money as we need to operate the system, but looking forward in the future, we see things that are gonna get more expensive. So yes, we do probably need to increase those rates. Thank you. Yeah. So this is gonna be our last, we did promise to get y'all out of here at 6.30 okay. and home to your family. So maybe this can be our last question, unless okay. someone's got a question matter. I'd echo that one, but uh, housing is a big priority of yours. Um, a big part you know, of our housing uh, initiative mom and pop and individual landowners who rent out parts of their houses or have houses for rent. Um, since COVID, and I'm one of those mom and pop property owners that rent out their property and our tenants have been with us for ten, five and 10 years. Um, so they can't afford to leave. And uh, the problem restricts us from making any changes to that. That's fine, they're all great tenants. Um, but my point is uh, we've seen uh, uh, rent restrictions through COVID at zero, uh, one and a half or two last year, 3.5 this year, but we're looking at your increases of our costs of running those houses, 8%, 8.1, 8.4 now. How do, we, how do we make those, how do we resolve that? Our costs are way up. We're trying to keep kids in our houses, but uh, we're raising our ability, our ability to maintain those units. <coughs> No, the only thing you can do is reduce the costs for us to operate those homes. Um, but uh, yeah, the problem seems to have a heat on for landlords right now, so that's unfortunate. So if there are no further questions, we're gonna do a very short mix and mingle, so if you have questions you'd rather direct to individual counselors or to individual uh, staff of the RMW, you're welcome to do that. I think there's still some pizza left. Maybe not. But thank you all for coming. This is a vital part of the process. And please do fill out the surveys, share with your friends. See you next year.